This is Inside Town Hall, a behind-the-scenes look at city government and the issues affecting you and your family. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Inside Town Hall. I'm your host, Madeline Shields. Coming up in the program, we meet one of our newly elected city councilors, Janet Brecky. We'll hear all about her plans for the future of Sioux Falls when we return. Hi, I'm Dr. Dorn. And I'm Dr. Sprunk from Falls Community Health. We're here to talk to you today about childhood vaccinations. Dr. Sprunk, did you know the vaccines recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics for use in all children do not interfere with each other and can be safely given during a single visit? That's true. Like any medication, vaccines can cause side effects. The side effects from vaccines are almost always minor, such as redness and swelling where the shot was given, and go away within a few days. On the other hand, many vaccine-preventable diseases can be serious or even deadly. Even though many of these diseases are rare in the United States, they still occur around the world. Interestingly, the World Health Organization states that at least 10 million deaths have been prevented by vaccines between 2010 and 2015. For more information, talk to your pediatrician, family doctor, or Falls Community Health. Well, in May, two newly elected city councilors were sworn in, and today we are visiting with Janet Brecky. Thanks for joining us for Inside Town Hall. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you ran for city council. Well, I've had a, a long history with the city of Sioux Falls, and it's fun to be back, and it's fun to come back. I started my relationship with the city under Mayor Noby's administration. You're uh, dating yourself. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> And uh, I was an intern, I was still in law school at the time, and I was an intern in the city attorney's office. And then after a short stint with the state's attorney's office, I came back as the first full-time city attorney hired under Joe Cooper. Okay. And that is when the city attorney's office was actually started. They began at that point to phase out the part-time contract attorneys that they had, three of them, and then um, begin phasing in the city attorney's office. So I was the first full-time city attorney actually officed in City Hall pretty much started the office and set it up, and then eventually um, served under Jack White, Gary Hansen, and Dave Munson. Okay, so you've been in city government for many, many years. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. I'm married to Jeff Brecky, and I have mm -hmm. three adult children, uh, Morgan, Logan, and Rianne Brecky. All right, great. And you were a businesswoman as well um, during some parts of your life. After I left City Hall, I opened Honey Baked Ham Company and Cafe, and managed and operated that for 13 years. Wow. I just recently sold that two years ago and was looking for something meaningful to do and I thought about running for office. It was a good time for me to run for office because I wasn't doing it for any reason other than just the joy of serving. Um, I don't, I'm not building my resume, I'm not running for higher office. I just want to come back and um, you know, use my institutional knowledge to help help move the city forward. Is this your first elected position? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us. And let's talk a little bit about what do you hope to accomplish on the city council? What are some of the things that uh, you want to do in Sioux Falls and for Sioux Falls? Well, there's really three main reasons that I ran. And it was as I've watched the city grow, I've become concerned about the social problems that we're starting to experience as a result of our rapid growth. And I decided that I think that that's an area where we really need some creative energy to tackle them. And we can learn a lot from our cities, you know, and the east and west coast about what not to do. You know, if they had it to do over again, how would they grow their city? And I think that we've been so excited about our growth that we've, we've, we're not really preparing ourselves or doing the kinds of things we need to do to handle the social problems. So I've got three programs that I've, you know, I've, I've been working on, you know, kind of, you know, a, during the campaign, and one of them is has to do with a, an, another enhanced neighborhood improvement program. I was involved in the first two mm -hmm. uh, that the city I actually co-authored those with the health department um, projects, nice and keep. And there's a third project that I'd like to work on called Raise, uh, restore all individuals to safe environments. And I see that as a joint private, a br joint private public par partnership where government comes in and does what it can do alongside of the private sector, you know, through churches and nonprofits and business and other, you know, groups, you know, helping the neighborhood, you know, raise up to an even higher than minimum standard, which is what projects Nice and Keep, you know, were, were designed to do. 
So there's that idea. Um, there's another thing I'm really concerned about, um, how the original goals of the Multicultural Center were to you know, be, act as a funnel mm -hmm. uh, for diversity into our community. And that's sort of gotten derailed, and, and I think we need to just address that whole issue, whether it be the Multicultural Center, but we need to address the diversi diversity issue. And I'm really, I really want to focus on fluent English, um, having widespread, um, extreme opportunities to learn fluent English. It's a big commitment. It takes seven years to learn fluent English. But I think that that is the key um, to our future success, because if we're going to invite these people into our community, and they're going to come in and work these $10 an hour jobs, and we expect them to lift themselves up by their bootstraps, I think that is the single most important vehicle to help them do that, is to make a commitment to, and to, to fluent English. And I, I um, have had conversations with the school district. There are literally hundreds of English classes being taught every day. Is there some way we can engage in a joint relationship and tap into those, tap into those, those classes? And I think that they would be very excited to work with us. And Where do you think the shortfall is coming from with, with people um, who have you know, EL, um, S, English as a second language. You know, I know Lutheran Social Services works on some of those issues, but um, how are we not reaching everyone that needs to, to take more than just a basic course? Well, it, it, it's just, it's what there's funding for. And right now, uh, you know, LSS is working under federal contracts, and they're, all that they're funded to teach is workplace English. So there's workplace English, conversational English, fluent English. Workplace takes eight weeks. That's not very much English. Conversational takes three years. You know, fluent English takes seven. So it's, it's a commitment, but I think it's one of those commitments that if we can work creatively, I don't see it having to be that expensive. Um, you know, it's 300 people coming in a year in that refugee program. Certainly it will compound, but as they learn fluent English, their job opportunities and educational opportunities improve right along with that. You can, be, you can move from being a maid to being a waitress when you can speak English, from being to a shoe salesman to going to STI and getting education. Um, I think that that's you know, a, a real exciting opportunity that we need to you know, work together on the school district and, and, and really take ownership of that as a city. So when people have the workplace English and then they go to work and they work all day, how can they be expected to learn fluent English? I mean, where is the time in the day? That's exactly where my motivation for doing this came from. There's just nothing in place that's accommodating this. You can't expect people to work three $10 an hour jobs in order to make a, put food on the table and then go to night classes out at STI when we have the transit issues that we have, the transportation issues. You know, in the conversations that I've had you know, in, in the green light thinking stage, I mean, we've got this TV station, we've got electronics, we've got hundreds of English classes, like I said, being taught by the school district. Is there a cheaper, accessible um, way that we can, you know, that we can make these, this, th these opportunities available? And I, I just believe it's, you know, with, with good thinking and, you know, and um, thinking outside the box, there's, there's, way, there's much we can do. And you have lots of other things you'd like to talk about. Um, one of them was the canon of ethics. I'd like to okay. talk about the seven canons of ethics. Okay. The city has a code of ethics that was adopted in 1992. And that particular code of ethics was a model code of, code of ethics which set the highest standard of ethics for the city. The, the, the city council at that time who was implementing the Home Rule Charter form of government um, believed that that was the level, uh, that was the standard that they wanted this city to operate under. And those canons haven't been changed. The, their inspirational statements, uh, Canon 1 talks about, you know, honor the law, the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, avoid the appearance of impropriety, perform duties diligently, conduct the affairs of the city in an open and public manner, you know, following the letter and intent of the law. I'm just paraphrasing them, but these are the kind, that, you know, and I'll, and I'll just continue. Limiting personal affairs to avoid conflicts of interest with official duties. Refrain from in, inappropriate political activity. Conduct the affairs consistent with the letter and spirit of the law. The canons are the inspirational statements. And for me, when I, you know, introduced myself back into city government, 
for me, putting the canons and the code of ethics is just like wrapping a quilt around me. This is how I want to operate in this office. This is how I want to serve, and this is where we all need to start. And particularly, you know, under this new administration, I'm trying to encourage, you know, the council members and the mayor to embrace the code of ethics. Because in addition to the canons, and it has the ethics board, which helps give you guidance, you know, upon request, and also enforces the conflicts of interest ordinance, which is, which is how you really enforce the canons of ethics. But I think that it, you know, it helps you know, guide you in the direction that you want to go. And, and one of the things that I've seen as I've returned is that, that we have sort of, uh, the government has closed itself off um, from the public in a way that I'm uncomfortable with. And so when I go to the, the canons and I read that, and I read that you know, following the letter and intent of the law, following open meeting laws, open government, open um, government order and decorum, all of those kinds of things. Um, those are the kinds of things we should be striving for. And so when I do that, then it helps me to set the kinds of goals that I want to set to shift the structure in government back to a place where we are more open and we are more transparent. Where do you see um, that the public's not being informed in, in certain issues of what is going on at, at the city government level? Well. You know, in good government, you know, you have checks and balances, you have balance of powers, um, and again, you really need to, you know, the philosophy that needs to be adopted is when in doubt, open it up. Not, not how closed can we keep it? How can we just barely comply? But when in doubt, open it up. We want to be squeaky clean as to the law. We want to, you know, again, embrace open meeting laws, not tolerate them. And what I see in the current structure is several things that, that do the exact opposite. You know, one of them um, is how our briefing system is set up for the council. You know, the city council as a whole, as a full body, does not receive a briefing on meeting agenda items. So we go into a, a meeting, agen you know, our council meetings, and we've not sat down as a full body and been briefed by the staff and the mayor on what is on that agenda. That information is getting to us in all kinds of different ways. And one of the ways it gets to us is some of the council members are invited to a director's meeting every week. Some of them are not. Some of them receive red notes from this meeting. And some of them choose not to go to the meeting because the red notes are marked confidential. Um, so you've got different levels of briefing. So you know, if I had not been given a slot uh, you know, by Christine Erickson, our chair, because she was going to be gone. I would not have had a briefing on meeting agenda items until this August, August 8th. If you, if they do call the whole city council together for a briefing, then that is a meeting which then everyone has to be informed of in terms of the news media and because there's a quorum. There's some... Absolutely. Uh, so and are you saying that, that you want to have a meeting before the meeting? Yes. Okay. I want to have an agenda briefing meeting where we're briefed on agenda items, fully transparent with the public. I want the media to make it easier for the media to cover emerging issues. You know, if, if they, should, if they should be invited to this meeting and welcome. They would know then that this is, you know, what, you know the, the, the opportunity for the council to ask questions of the mayor and his staff about the items that are coming up on the agenda so that when they get to their official meeting, now's their time to engage the public. They've gotten their mayor, their information from the mayor, the directors, their questions answered. Now is their time with the public to get that final piece of the puzzle so that they can make a well-informed decision. Is that not just a repeat of, of the meeting? I guess my question is, is, is if you have a meeting before the meeting and there's a quorum and everyone's invited to discuss what's going to happen at the meeting, it's, it's I don't know, I, my question is, is it redundant? It's a time for the council to get their questions answered. Their questions answered from directors and staff. And if they need additional ma information to make the decision, to request that from the mayor and staff. Mm -hmm. I need more information to make this okay. decision. And yes, the, the media should be fully aware of this and it should be a place that they're watching and that they know that that's a place that they should be covering that from time to time 
and, and watching as those issues emerge. And then at the meeting, yes, the, the staff can still, this still comes up and, and you know, summarizes the event and what's going on and, and, and continues to answer questions. But the focus of the meeting can then be about engaging the public into the process and hearing their concerns. And, and that, that is, again, the final piece that allows the council to make that informed decision. Um, and, and again, that's what that meeting's for. That's the meeting sure. with the public. The council is the public arm of government, and they need to be you know, um, embracing that meeting with the public. It's about the public is what that meeting is about. Sure. Uh, one of the codes that you talked about, or the canons of ethics, was conflicts of interest. Do you see uh, a problem with conflicts of interest and um, knowing that this is a part-time job for people so, you know, many, many city councilors have full-time jobs um, in the private sector, then they serve as a part-time city councilor. Is, is that where you see the conflict of interest coming from? You know, there's different places, you know, the, the ordinance addresses different areas, but the canons are clear that you should arrange your personal life as to create minimum conflicts. And then the conflicts of interest is, you know, and, and that you should not serve if you cannot do so. Okay, and then the conflicts of interest ordinance is clear that um, you know when you have you know when you have a conflict, you need to remove yourself you know from discussion of it. Announce you know declare your conflict in front of the public, and then step down and remove yourself from all discussion, you know, and all involvement in the in the topic. Okay. So it provides for you know minimum conflicts to happen and how to address them, but you know it is it is clear that if you if you're going to in, be in this position, um, you shouldn't elect to be in it if you know that you're going to have too many conflicts and have to step down from too many issues. Okay. All right. Well, at this time, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about good government structure. We are visiting with Janet Brecky. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Wickersham with Falls Community Health, here to talk about staying cool in the summer heat. When in the sun, wear light-colored clothing and a wide-brimmed hat. Spend time in the shade when able. Drink water every 15 minutes, even if you are not thirsty. And monitor those around you for symptoms of heat exhaustion, such as dizziness, headache, muscle cramps, nausea, and vomiting. If you experience any of these symptoms, please contact a physician immediately. Well, welcome back to Inside Town Hall, where, where we are visiting with Janet Brecky, who is our newly elected city councilor. Uh, we're talking about good government, and let's talk a little bit about the structure of our government. You were here at the very beginning when Sioux Falls changed its government structure. Let's go back a little bit and explain to people um, how this worked and how are we doing today? You know, you're right. As I as I worked my way up the city attorney's ladder, I started as si assistant city attorney, then chief assistant city attorney, and eventually at the point when we transformed from the five commission form of government to the strong mayor policy setting council form of government, I became the city attorney under Gary Hansen. And so my first task as the city attorney, because he was the newly elected mayor, you know, that came out, flowed out of the commission form of government along with Bob Jamison, who was one of the sitting council members at the time, it flowed out of the commission form. And it was that first council and Gary Hansen and I, you know, through my office, you know, you know, actually, you know, breathed life in to this charter form of government. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is to just kind of explain to people in a, in a real brief nutshell how it's supposed to work. And it is a really fabulous form of government because at that moment, I mean, I did, I researched not only the one that we, I was implementing, but all the others to kind of see where it stood in the grander scheme of thing. Mm -hmm. And I also spent lots of time down in Vermilion with Doc Farber, you know, understanding political science and, you know, what, what good government structure is, checks and balances, accountability, process, all of those kinds of things, and closely with the charter drafters, Joe Kirby, Dale Froelich, Bill Peterson, they became my best friends. When I had, you know, catching it, it was like, well, what was your intent? I could just call them, what was your intent when you did this? Because I'm breathing life into it, it was good to know. So when I did it, I felt very confident about the job we did, that we did it, you know, exactly how it was supposed to be done. I mean, I, I still feel that today, because we really did our legal research, you know, our, our history, historical research, and, and then just, you know, again, use those experts, you know, to help us do it. 
Can you explain to people who may be new to Sioux Falls, what was the form of government before, and then when did we adopt this new charter form of government? I'd love to. You know, through all of this, I became a government nerd. So, <laughs> I mean, I really love good government. I do, and I get excited about it. This is the old form, and this is the commission form of government. Again, there was a three, and then there's a five. So this was the five piece, and I described it as a piece of pie with each council member, member, or excuse me, with each commissioner, you know, having a piece of the pie. It was all defined by statute. They had their own little area of responsibilities, and the mayor was in no stronger than any of the commissioners. Sure, and so what you mean by that is we had a police commissioner who was in, in charge of the police force and law enforcement. And, and then we had a commissioner. A sewer and, and a street and, commissioner. Right, streets and, and parks and and everybody had their own responsibility and that's who they dealt with. Right. And then we changed our form of government. Right. It became very bifurcated and dis dysfunctional mm -hmm. because they, they were so concerned with their own areas they had a difficult time you know, seeing the bigger picture and working together because it was more of a negotiation than a collaboration. And the d dysfunctionality kind of is what caused the success of the, of the future change. Mm -hmm. And so when they changed, they changed it to the strong mayor policy setting council form of government. And I always give it the long term because over the years it's been shortened to strong mayor. And quite frankly, it's kind of evolved to super strong mayor, but that was never intended. What was intended is what I have here. I used the yin yang symbol. Mm -hmm. It's two respected bodies working side by side together you know, in a circular fashion, in a collaborative fashion, you know, moving the city forward in a single direction. And this, you know, separated the powers versus a statutory assignment. What this did is gave the mayor all the executive and administrative powers and the council the legislative and policy setting powers and final oversight over the, all of the fee revenue generation, the budget, and the CIP. They are equals. It's kind of a check, check balance thing, a check, checkmate thing for everything that the mayor does, the council has oversight over it, either in the financial way or the legislative way. And so I use this. This is kind of how I show the checks and balances. You have, you know, half on the mayor's side, half on the city council side. You know, the mayor, you know, the mayor appoints, the city gives advice and consent. The mayor, you know, presents the budget, the city adopts it. The mayor negotiates the contracts. The city, you know, does has final say. And uh, the those mayor, kinds of things. And the mayor is a full time job, whereas the city councilors are part time city councilors. Correct. Okay. And so I think it's important that at the moment, it is my opinion that the council has evolved into an underutilized role. They've never evolved into the full policy, you know, the broad policy initiative initiative setting body that they were designed to be. And the best way I can demonstrate this is through this, you know, it's a basketball, you know, what I would call, you know, an, an athletic analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, what you have in like, in the, and this is a basketball, but you could use any sport. You know, you always have that rules committee, you know, over that's, that's actually affecting how the game is being played on the floor, you know, by the rules that they set. And then you got the mayor, the mayor's down here, mayor's coach, he controls the entire game on the floor. He can, you know, sub people in, sub people out. He, he, everything that's going on the floor, he has the authority to make it happen within the rules that are established by the policy setting body. So in that, you know, in its best form, and when this government works best, is when they become heavily engaged and involved, not in what the mayor's doing, not in his day-to-day -day operation, you know, you know nor, nor in, you know, they need to trust, to have a trust in their mayor, a belief in their mayor, and much of what he brings to them should just be routine. Mm -hmm. Because if they're doing their job, they're going to be driving his direction through the policy setting function. And so when I came back and saw this, you know, when I started sitting on council meetings and observed this, what I realized was missing is that we need to set up structure so that the city can ga engage in a, a long range strategic planning process, citywide. So that literally you've got the mayor and his staff and team alongside of the council as, as each individual, all eight council members, you know, working through a facilitator to develop a citywide long range plan. And in that kind of a discussion and debate, that's where you decide what's the city's number one issue. Is it economic development? Is it poverty? Is it housing? 
Is it infrastructure? What's the city's number one, number two, number three, number four, and how do we tackle these? You have goals, a mission statement, action plans, objectives. Any large organization, when I give this speech, like a Sanford, it will just go, well, heck yeah. How do you run something that big without a long-range strategic plan? And that piece has never been put into place. You know, we have a budget ordinance that says there shall be a budget. It shall contain blank. It shall be adopted blank. What we need is an ordinance that says there shall be a citywide strategic plan. It shall contain goals, objectives, action plans, timelines. And then I think you will see the city council and mayor working together collaboratively to really move this city forward nicely into the next decade. Who do you seeing as uh, establishing these these lists of goals? Because remember, there are still eight people on the council. How do you get all of them to agree and to work as one body? You do it just like the school district did. And I've actually had conversations with Dr. Maher. And I asked him, and I asked him if I could say this out loud. I said, do you think citywide long-range planning would help the city? He said, oh my gosh, yes. I think it would help the city. They, they've, they adopted one two years ago. You actually hire a facilitator who is an expert in doing, they hired one who's an expert in doing um, long-range planning for, for um, school districts. I'm sure there's, there's organizations out there that are experts in doing them for city, you know, for city government. Well, I think many businesses have strategic plans as well. I mean, you know, I work for a nonprofit and we've had a strategic plan that went through and you, you hire someone in to come in and find out what we need to do for the next five years, the next 10 yeah. years. Is that what you're, you're talking you about? You hire a facilitator that helps you, you know, navigate the process and the process would involve the public. I know in the school districts, they went in and out twice. They, you know, had rough, they got, they solicited information from the public at the beginning, I think the middle, maybe even three times, mm -hmm. but in and out back to the public, you know, in and out, it'll be back and forth between the mayor, the council, all of us together um, until you finally have a, have a final product. And then that'll be your plan, and then you review it, you adopt that plan, and then you review it annually. Because all of a sudden you have a tornado and all of a sudden got to shift the plan around, you know, right. so you have that flexibility. And if you are excited about something and want it to, you know, like a program, like right. the program that I, two programs I just talked to you about, you know, I'm going to want to try to get those into the plan. And your council members, um, if they're effective at getting things into the plan, they're going to be in effective in representing their constituents. And we all have different constituents talking in our ears. So it'll be much more, we'll be much more um, responsive to them if we can work together in a plan. Because all, you've got all of that, that, those nine, what I call those nine election certificates working in tandem, you know, with all those voices being heard to move the city forward. Okay. Well, we, I'm sure, will hear more about this. And as time goes on, you're on the city council for the next four years. So we will have you back as a guest on Inside Town Hall. And that's our time. So if you would like to get a hold of Councillor Janet Breckney, you can go to SiouxFalls.org, or if you would like to get more information of news and happenings at the City of Sioux Falls, you can sign up for alerts on SiouxFalls.org. Thanks for watching.